So I, I'd like to uh, sort of open it up and uh, just do a quick review of what we discussed last week. And I want to ask that to anybody. Um, what have you been able to do differently this week um, compared to, uh, you know, what you did, uh, your normal routine? Have you created a new routine? Have you integrated mindfulness? Have you been thinking about the implanted, imprinted, inspired mindset? Um, love to hear from, from anybody who wants to uh, chime in. One of the concepts that I walked away with and really practicing was uh, in the mindfulness was the three by three. So taking time throughout the day, um, especially when I'm trying to transition into something new to really get focused. What, uh, what does your routine consist of? I'm not doing the, the 10 minute in the morning thing, but I'm finding myself that if I take three minutes um, before I launch in, so I'll do it in the morning, uh, three to three to five minutes, and then sometime throughout the middle of the day when I'm transitioning into something different as far as a work activity. Um, and then again in the afternoon when I'm transitioning into kind of like getting out of office work home um, and into kind of being mindful about the time I'm doing, spending personally on either self-development or with family or connecting with people. Um, how did your feelings change about yourself in the process? I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, but uh, this morning in preparing for today, the thing that I've noticed is uh, less anxiety. Um, so I'm feeling a lot calmer. So, and I don't, it, that could be directly linked to the fact that I'm able to accomplish kind of the bigger tasks. When you talk uh, less anxiety, how would you describe uh, the anxiety that you had before you uh, made that change? Where does it come from is kind of reducing the noise. The thing that I came into the first last week was just there's a lot going on. Um, so much coming at us, so much that we're trying to push out. Um, and engage and have dialogue. So what I've noticed is that going from, you know, 15, uh, trying to accomplish 15 things that the three to five rule um, and really focusing on the big boulders rather than all this stuff that's going on in them, either in the market and the economy with clients um, and doing things with a little bit more purpose. I think the, the multitasking exercise we did last week uh, really helped and uh, it, it also helps me focus. Jerome, do you want to chime in and uh, talk a little bit about how your week was different because of last week? And by the way, Natalie Gelman has joined us. Hi, Natalie. Hi, how are you? You look terrific. <clears throat> Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm excited to, to, see, to meet everyone and learn some stuff myself and yeah thank you jerome yeah Garrett. uh for, for me I, I did take the uh the the, the lead and, and put the the uh, thing in my phone to wake up every morning with a, with a 10 minute block out for uh the relaxation technique that we worked on last week i found that that early in the morning is a, is a good time for me to do that um simply because there, there seems to be less confusion in my life at that time of the day. So, but, I, but I have noticed that it has allowed me to, to, to think more openly about uh, a plan of attack for the day, the, the things, as, um, as David was saying, you know, maybe not focusing on all the little rocks, but, but maybe tackle the two or three things uh, in the day that, I, that are at the top of the list and, and just focus on those and not focus on the, the entirety of the day. And it has, it, I, I can tell it's helped me to, um, to relax and to, to come across with a, with a better strategy for the day each day. Yeah, I, I imagine, you know, based on what I know about you, you have a, a tremendous achievement drive. Uh, you know, you got a PhD at age 57. And, uh, you know, that says a lot about uh, your ambition. And, and sometimes when you have a lot of drive, it's hard to shut it off. Yeah, I agree. I, I do find that happens a lot. I, um, um, you know, I've, this summer has been intriguing with, with being back home. It's been great to be back home away from the, uh, from the, the physical school environment with all the things that are happening there with COVID and everything. But, but you know, when you come home, there, there are additional things that sometimes you put on the plate. And uh, I, be, being the, the professor in the family with all the grandkids that have been home 
at the end of the fall, the spring school year and then into the summer, I've had to take on a different teaching role uh, for some of my uh, grandkids. And I, and I joke with their teachers now that when they come back to school this fall, I, I'm not a common core math guy. Uh, so my, my kids are going to be carrying the one when it comes to multiplying and adding uh, this fall when they go back to school. So I'm uh, so that, that's been a, a bit of a different role. Uh, you know, in the in the higher education world, we, we present a lot of information and make a lot of resources available because we, we want the students to apply themselves and learn because they already know a lot of the basic stuff that we're teaching uh, from that standpoint. But for elementary school kids, a lot of them don't know that two plus two is four. And we have to teach them some, some basic foundational uh, learning components of, of, of basic you know, knowledge in the world. And uh, so that, that's been a bit of a shift for me because I'm teaching in two totally different environments now. It's fun, it's challenging, but it is uh, a couple of extra pieces on the plate. Yeah, it uh, requires a lot of patience. Um, thank you, Jerome. Uh, Mark, uh, would you like to share um, how your week was a little bit different uh, because of last um, of the last session? Sure. So I've been able to take around 10 minutes in the morning, probably around 40 days uh, since last week. And basically, that's one of the things that really jumped out at me is that that 10 minutes seems like a really long time um, versus if I'm just doing something else or scrolling through my phone. Well, I look up and 30 minutes went by and it doesn't seem like one minute. All of a sudden when I'm meditating and doing that whole 10 minute thing, now it seems like it's forever. You know, I'm like waiting for the alarm clock to go off. Like, hey, what's going on? Is it 10 minutes? Do I need it? Did I set the alarm right? So it's just really different being able to really focus on that time and kind of almost plan out the day as well. So it's been interesting. Well, thank you. Uh, it sounds like, uh, anybody else wants to uh, make a quick comment before I, kick it off. Yeah, this yeah. is Megan. Can you hear me? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I uh, turn my video on here. Um, am picking up my lunch. And also I did the three by three as well, where I uh, just really prioritized the top tasks and could kind of echo what some other people said, where I felt much less stressed and also was able to kind of get so much more done this week so um had a great experience with that oh that's good it's great i'm i'm glad to hear that that you're integrating mindfulness and you look calmer today thank you anybody else hey gerhard i just wanted to share uh one thing that i, I was watching the quincy jones documentary on netflix and you know he's one of the greats of all times and he just made this one comment he said you know he grew up in the 30s and 40s when there was lots of racism and he said me and ray charles we didn't let one ounce of our self-worth be determined by anyone else and that's pure mindset and when you have the right mindset you can accomplish anything so that's why i'm really happy to be uh here today uh natalie do you practice mindfulness i do <laughs> i've i've struggled with meditation i really re uh, resonated with um I'm still learning everyone's names. Was it Mark who said that? Um, I, it's hard for me to sit there sometimes and I do feel like meditating uh, can even five minutes or short, it's better to start short and then expand from there. And I found the best time for me to meditate is after a lot of exercise. Because I feel like, ex for me, exercise really releases endorphins and I'll be talking about music in a little bit but I'm like listening to music and then, um, and my, my specific exercise that I do is um, affirmations during a uh, different kind of sort of aerobics and like weight lifting using your own weights. And so I'm already in a really good headspace and I focus on like a thing that I want to do um, in that whatever big project or task or issue is on my plate I'll focus on that at the start of my workout and then at the end kind of meditate for just a few minutes but maybe that's an idea for people is I find that that's and and then I usually will be working out earlier in the day okay, so for me I find meditation and just sitting there very difficult but if I'm in nature I find that I'm getting um focused on and present and I think that's, for me, the point of meditation is either to work with your mindset and, and have more of the mindset you want to have or to 
clear the slate. If you're constantly thinking, you're constantly solving problems, sometimes they get worked out when you're not going, going, going. And you're like, right. oh, look at this beautiful view and look at that fox or that bunny. Or, yeah, so nature um, and after workouts. Yeah. This week's been uh, actually difficult because of a, sp a specific individual that I've been having some problems with. Um, and um, been pressing a lot of buttons. So uh, I, I always forget the ones that you talk about, the, the stickers. What are, what are right. the ones called? The stickers? Yeah, the, the floaters, the grabbers, and the stickers. Yeah. There, there are three, of, three forms of self-talk. Right, so there's been a lot of sticking going on. So, okay. um, you know, in, in meditation and mindfulness, there's something called a meta meditation, which is you think of somebody and you wish them kindness. So it's a, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be well. And so you, you wish yourself that, and then you wish them that. And the idea is by repeating it, you get out of the stickiness and you start to relate to the person as um, not their personality and not their behavior and not the situation, but you just have a chance to step back and be a little softer and relate to people from a more mindful place. And uh, it's hard when you're really in it. It's like really hard, you know? So um, the point that I'm trying to make is if you have a regular practice, you, you, ha you, have, you can fall on that and you can fall on certain techniques. And it, it was just very helpful for me this week. So. Yeah, I, li I like the, the way you send good wishes uh, even to your enemies, detoxifies you and uh, you uh, become more centered and you come up with better ideas to mediate the situation. Exactly. So uh, the question I have for you, Jonathan, did you resolve your issues or is it still ongoing? Uh, they're, they're working, but they're, 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 not in, they're, not in, in, they're not in the fire anymore. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so you took down the temperature, which is great. Yeah, it's much, much better, much more manageable for everybody. So what, what I'd like to do now is, uh, um, Natalie, are you okay that um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the mindset operating system? And, yeah. Uh, and then you take notes and then you put everything into a song. How is that? Uh, I might. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so... Last week, we talked about the mindset operating system, and um, we have the implanted mindset that comes from our parents, the imprinted from people that uh, impress us like teachers or mentors, and then we have the inspired mindset that's sort of the inner voice. And uh, so another way to think about this is to uh, remind yourself that what you, uh, what was implanted is limited. So that a limited mindset and uh, you want to be aware of um, the fact that uh, some of that implanted mindset can be changed, it can be edited. And I sort of compared it to, to a garden that where you can continue to water the flowers and stop watering the weeds. Um, and then uh, you have uh, teachers and mentors and that is the expansion part of, of your mindset operating system. And then you go to the inner voice and that's where no, limited, no limit thinking comes into place. And uh, this is sort of a, another recap slide that early experiences lead to future beliefs. So as you grew up, uh, you learned your parents' beliefs and behaviors and, and there are core beliefs that I want to uh, pay attention to today, which is your belief about education, about work, about money, about success, about relationships and health and fitness. So most of those core beliefs that you carry have a strong connection to the past. And if you want to change your life in any way, shape or form and create a better future, you want to revisit some of those beliefs and challenge them and edit them and change them and let go of self-limiting beliefs 
and uh, connect with more empowering beliefs. So the mindset creates your destiny. And then I want to review this also quickly because there are a couple of people who have not been able to make it last week. Uh, which is, what zone do you live in? And there are three zones in our mind. There's the fog zone, the comfort zone, and the growth zone. And the uh, fog zone is when we experience anxiety, self-pity, depression, high stress, or anger. And uh, comfort zone, we are relaxed. Um, and the growth zone, we are focused. And it sounds like what you have been doing since last week, you have been trying to move into the growth zone and stay there longer. Because you know, when you're in the fog zone, you're numb. In the comfort zone, you're stagnant. And in the growth zone, you're flourishing. And that's the operative word for today. How can we flourish longer and uh, make this a, a goal so that um, you flourish all the time? And in order to flourish, we need to fix the fog zone, leave the comfort zone, and stay longer in the growth zone. And um, one of the things that companies are doing right now is there's a lot more anxiety. Um, research shows that, uh, you know, in average times, uh, about 26, 27 percent of people uh, have, you know, have to put up with some chaos in their lives and they're anxious or they're depressed. And it's about 26 percent. But now in the COVID crisis, it went up to 38 percent in some cases. And uh, 56 percent of people with anxiety uh, have lower work performance. <clears throat> and I told you last week that um, a survey at salesforce.com uh, where they have polled their 50,000 employees, they found that 36% suffer from mental health issues. And therefore, it's so necessary to integrate mindfulness, reduce that anxiety, uh, contain it, uh, become more focused and flourish. And um, this is another th site that I found that salesforce.com has created, and I recommend it. Um, it's called Be Well Together. So be dash well together, put it in, in Google, and you find uh, a lot of good information about better sleep, managing anxiety, dealing with isolation, building resilience, eating, mindfulness, and all those good things. It's, it's a good go-to place. And uh, Mark Benioff has uh, always been someone who wants to contribute to society, and that's why he created this for his uh, 55,000 employees, uh, and uh, he's sharing it with the world. Um, now, I, um, I just did an interview this week with um, Bill McDermott, and I want to show you an example of uh, an individual who always stays in the growth zone. You know, he has written a book called Win a Stream. Uh, there has been a, a national bestseller. Uh, it's still on the bestseller list after four years. And uh, he is the CEO of ServiceNow. Uh, just as a background, when he's, uh, he was the CEO of SAP for 10 years. And, uh, and uh, SAP is a uh, 170 or $180 billion market cap company. Um, and he stepped down, uh, took a job with ServiceNow, and we did, he, he took over and paid attention to the numbers. Um, the company value, the stock value was $49 billion. And it was in November. And today, the market cap of ServiceNow is $82 billion. So here's one individual who came in and changed everything with his mindset. And I wanna give you uh, a, a quick view of um, uh, that The interview. question I have is, uh, is there anything ever that uh, gives you doubt about where you are at this point? Absolutely. There's something that always gives me doubt. You know what it is? complacency. And I, I really do have very brief moments of celebration. 
And I tell people this all the time. I wish I could celebrate more. I wish I could take more time to dance around the yard or walk around the block and wave a banner. You know, things went pretty well today. But the reality is, if you just think about a quarter in the business of software, the second that you finish a quarter in every time zone around the world, in one tick of one second of the clock, you've now entered into a new dimension, into a dimension where you get to renew yourself and prove yourself all over again. And it worries me if I see people that celebrate too long or sit back too far and think that they have gotten there. Gerhard, we'll never get there. We are spending our life in pursuit of something that we can never get. Success is a race without a finish line. Perfection is an altruistic goal that's worth chasing, but you have to acknowledge you'll never get there. And that chase is what gives me amazing energy. But at the same time, it also cautions me because if you see complacency, you have instantaneous doubt. So a leader must galvanize thousands and thousands to acknowledge that it's important to take that moment of celebration and reinvest it in the next set of goals and then get busy all over again. Because the joy is in the dream chase, not actually in catching the dream. Any thoughts on that? I agree. It's like the anticipation of Christmas or something big is, I don't know, I'm the same way where it's the anticipation and the journey versus Christmas morning, I guess. It's fun, don't get me wrong, but I, I agree with that sentiment very much. My reaction, Gerhard, is sounds like there's a lot of anxiety involved and I don't want a part of it. <laughs> I mean, I want to be successful and I want to grow and I want to contribute and I want to do all good things. But if I can't relax and I'm always nervous and I'm always have a sense of anxiety about me, and I don't know if he does, I'm just giving you my reaction, then, then I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, well, he, he does a lot of other things that uh, keep him happy. You know, he's, he's uh, somebody who knows how to balance himself and then and stay, and stay in that happy zone. Um, but he, he that, plays. that sounds unbelievable. Yeah, he plays basketball, and uh, he's sort of using that uh, metaphor of uh, being quick, being nimble, being agile, being responsive, being a team player, you know, sharing the ball with other people. Um, so, and so he also, said he played basketball, you had me go. Right, and uh, he, uh, he knows how to take good care of himself, but he has an internal engine that's wired for for achievement and uh and and he has a lot of fun in the process good for him i wanted to say that i was going to talk about this in uh the third class that i'm doing but that kind of always looking for how you can improve is a big part of being a musician um and learning an instrument and it's playing something to the best of your ability and then going can i make this 10 percent better the next day with more practice or breaking something down so I really like that kind of pursuit of perfection, knowing that you're just going to do your best that day. Yeah, when he says that complacency worries him, um, I think that's a healthy reflex uh, because he wants to do something significant with his life. And uh, people who have no, uh, no limit thinkers, uh, they want to invest in, in a life where they function optimally, you know, physically, cognitively, emotionally, and financially. Okay, so to flourish, you need to achieve a, a ratio between negative emotion, positive and negative emotions that's no less than three to one. So keep this in mind when you are in a zone where you have a conflict with somebody uh, or you have negative thoughts or you have negative experiences, um, you need to work a little bit harder uh, to restore that um, optimal function. So here's uh, something that we, we, um, we briefly mentioned last week, 
but there are three paths to flourishing. Um, there's cognitive intelligence, there's emotional intelligence, and there's physical intelligence. And all three require action. And, uh, and there are some books that I, I recommend if you uh, are interested in, in doing a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, Feeling Good at the New Mood Therapies by Dr. David Burns. Um, he has written that book in, uh, I think, 1980, and it's still on the bestseller list today. And uh, he, uh, you know, th this is a book about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy applied to uh, mood disorders, as he calls it, where uh, when people read the book, it lowers their anxiety. When people read their book, it lowers uh, their depression and uh, they can manage themselves more effectively. And there was even a, a study done where they compared the book to some uh, group taking uh, medication and people who read the book uh, sort of outperformed the people that took the medication. Um, the... Uh, the, the book that I recommend for emotional intelligence, especially in sales, is uh, Chet Blount's book. Um, he worked very hard on that book. It has not done that well um, in, uh, you know, as a bestseller, but I think it has really great information. And then there's this new book by um, uh, Claire Dale and uh, Patricia Payton, Physical Intelligence. I interviewed those uh, uh, last week and walked away with a lot of great information and I should have the videos ready uh, by the end of this week. But uh, so what, what I want you to think about, there, there are three responses to any difficulty. There's a cognitive response, an emotional response, and a physical response. And um, the first, um, you know, the, the IQ, the cognitive behavioral therapy was in sort of invented or popularized by Dr. Albert Ellis. And uh, he's sort of the father of cognitive behavioral therapy. The second is the new mood uh, therapy. David Burns was a disciple of Dr. Aaron Beck, who is also called the father of cognitive behavioral therapy. There, there are many, many books. So if you want to, um, you know, work on that side and get more insight, uh, any one of those books is really, really helpful. We did a study with another cognitive behavioral ther uh, therapist and, and professor, um, Simon Epstein. Uh, he was with the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And we gave him access to top performers who made over a million dollars uh, selling power readers and, uh, and people who made about $150,000, $250,000. So we called them the average achievers and we called the other group the high achievers. And we sent them a, a, sent them a questionnaire that took about 35 minutes to complete. And uh, we got about 120 surveys back, which was extraordinary. But the bottom line is, it's that constructive thinking style that sets the super achievers, the highest achievers apart from the average achievers. So they have higher levels of cognitive functioning and they appraise reality objectively and they don't make um, you know, judgment based on uh, the distortion lens that everybody has built into their system. And here's an example, uh, ineffective versus effective thinking style. So um, let's say in sales, you lose an account. You lost a large account. What is the response? Um, any situation leads to cognitive um, uh, machinations where the brain kicks in and feelings emerge. And, and those thoughts and feelings can go two directions. You can talk to yourself and say, I lost a deal and I'm a failure. And you remember other failures. So you associate that experience with a lot of other failure experiences. And the consequence is you avoid calling on large accounts. Or you can say, I can learn and change, I can improve, and I can call on more challenging accounts. So that is 
a very simplified way to examine your thinking style about any situation. And that's sort of the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy, where they say there's an activating event that leads to feelings, and the feelings lead to consequences. And uh, by working backwards and say, why don't we change our cognitive response to the event and change it from I'm a failure to I can change and improve, then you have better outcomes. And one uh, psychologist that I interviewed that uh, is Marty Seligman, we did a, a number of stories with him, but he he pinned it down in you know it categorizes it in a in a way that it becomes more accessible where he calls it explanatory styles and he did a um, study with a life insurance company in Philadelphia where they divided people into two categories the the positive explanatory styles and the the pessimistic explanatory style meaning the way people habitually interpret a situation. And to be more specific, um, there are two areas, uh, uh, you know, there are different divisions. One is the permanent explanatory style, I never get over this. And the temporary focus is, that's hard to take, but I will find more prospects. Uh, the global statement is, I can't seem to do anything right. You know, that's that's how uh, kids react, seven-year-olds. You know, the world is coming to an end. This is a catastrophe. My birthday party was canceled because of coronavirus. I can't go on like this. You know, I can't stand this. Um, and uh, everything is wrong Where, versus specific. I missed that one sale, but I can do better next time. Or there's the internal uh, explanation. I'm a loser or the external where the customer didn't have a need at this time. Or I have no control, you know, control versus controllable, where people say, there's nothing I can do about it. And controllable means I can spend more time finding better prospects. So it, it sounds so simple when you analyze it. And it is, kind of difficult to do uh, on your own. And my, uh, my recommendation is to actually take a piece of paper and uh, divide it in the middle. And on the left-hand side, you write down your automatic thoughts. Don't even call them explanatory style. Um, write down what happened. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I lost that sale. Uh, um, I'm, I'm a failure or I, I haven't gotten what it takes, uh, or I'm an idiot, or I made a fool of myself, or whatever it is. So you, on the left side, you write the automatic thoughts. On the right side, you write that more realistic appraisal, that more objective appraisal, and you talk back to that thought that re you wrote down. I'll never get over this. Uh, it, it's, it's challenging, but I will get over this. This, this is not going to last too long and then I make another sale. Well, I'm an idiot. No, that's not true. I'm smart. I made a lot of sales before. I can do it again. So by answering your own negative thoughts and converting them to more optimistic thoughts, uh, you're going to do better. You're going to feel better. You're going to make more sales. And Marty Seligman actually found that by taking a sample of sales executives, no, of of new trainees that they were not even trained, but he divided those people into, found out the optimistic people and then taught them sales. And then they took professional salespeople that were trained and compared to two and the optimistic people that have positive explanatory styles, they're outsold the professional like within six months but they're, they're taught them selling skills in the process. But in essence, the mindset is your foundation for your success. And you want to be aware that the way you explain a situation can either make you feel good or feel bad. And if you feel bad, 
then you, you have the opportunity to correct that. Any questions? All right, so let's move on. Uh, there's another study by, by Seligman where he found that optimists outsold pessimists by 21% in the first year and by 57% in the second year. So I recommend that, uh, you know, read, if you haven't read Seligman's books, uh, he has written a whole bunch of them, but the last one that I showed earlier, um, where you uh, learn how to get for, go from helplessness to hope, I think it's is amazing. So let me let me give you an, one more approach, one more uh, you know there's there's uh, the different ways uh, di different um, schools of um, psychology, and uh, you know there's the 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 cognitive behavioral therapy that's very popularized and there uh, are, I don't know, thousands of psychologists, they go by that. Uh, here's a more psychodynamic approach and uh, that is Dr. Kerry Salkovitz. And he's gonna join us um, in about three weeks. So I wanna give you a quick preview. There are two pandemics, there's clearly a pandemic of coronavirus, but it is making the world and all of us in it very anxious. We deal with anxiety in a range of ways. There's not one way that each of us manifests or expresses our anxiety. But I think that one of the important things is simply to heighten awareness among all of us in positions of leadership that it exists, to understand both where it comes from, but also to, um, to have some understanding of what its implications are for leaders and for, for all of us. So, so one is a fear of the, of the virus itself a fear of the devastating economic and social consequences of the virus. There's a spectrum of how people deal with anxiety. Um, on one end of the spectrum, I would describe just outright denial, kind of burying one's head in the sand. That is clearly not adaptive right now. It's downright dangerous to be in denial. On the other end of the spectrum, I would describe outright panic and hysteria. We need to be aware of the fact that anxiety has some very specific effects. One of them uh, is that, especially if we're not tuned into our own anxiety, it can interfere with our ability to think clearly and to perceive reality accurately. And if you think about that, those are two of the essential factors that allow us to make sound decisions. If we can't think clearly and if we can't perceive reality accurately enough, well, and these things are hard to do, um, then we're not going to be making the best decisions for the people that we are responsible for. Any comments on that? I agree. I agree with that, Gerhard. I love that. And um, I read a book called Managing the Stress Effect or the Stress Effect. And it echoes all of that. And I think it's that awareness and none of that is taught, right? So unless we're a leader actively pursuing the harmonization of our emotions and recognizing, why do I feel this way? What is going on right now? And then reading books like this and going after it to resolve those feelings so you can move forward and get into a better headspace. So I agree with you and I agree with you where it's hard to do on your own and you need an accountability buddy, right? And, and all that good stuff too, to, to cycle through. None of this is easy and we can't do it on our own. I agree. And uh, that's exactly why we are talking about this. We cannot do it alone. And um, it's good in those times to reach out um, be part of a group, uh, have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and uh, and also uh, think a little bit deeper about uh, what makes uh, people happy. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, people, you know, lead a life that's uh, guided by automatic thinking and not by creative thinking, and that's why uh, we have Natalie because she uh, creates new things all the time that didn't exist before. And uh, to me, uh, a creative life is a happier life. And people with a happy mindset, they um, have more energy, they're more productive, they are more creative. And salespeople with a happy mindset sell 38% more. And that's why some companies like IBM have uh, appointed a chief happiness officer. 
uh, Judy Buckholz, we interviewed her for Selling Power. She has uh, spoken at our conferences uh, and she said, you know, we have um, 17 people uh, in a team of 2000. They come up with new ideas on how to make other people happy so they can work more productively. Karen, can I just, uh, can, if I can just share one other thing. I, obviously, a lot of my perspectives are from a mindfulness perspective. And, you know, people go through their own evolution of self-awareness, right? And I'll, all of these things are so important and you can't get to one place until you get through other things. So, you know, I'm a native New Yorker. So by law, I have to be committed to psychotherapy and wearing black and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you can't live here, you know? So... Um, you can learn so much about yourself and how to deal with things through better understanding from a psychodynamic. But when you look at the, the uh, 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 Buddhist psychology, it's, it's a, a lot of detaching and thought habit. So where you get happiness and where you get space is not getting rid of all these thoughts because you never will, but by being less identified with them and therefore less entangled by them right so a, a, a good combination i think of mindfulness and the therapy and for some people medication are things that are all needed to get people to that space of being very balanced and very happy so that they can perform at their best so anyway i just wanted to share that yeah that, that's a good reminder i i thought you had two analysts uh, working with you i did actually but you know Times are tough, so I had to let go. <laughs> you know, I, you know you, things you have to sacrifice. Here. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I think that uh, somebody in Hollywood says, I have three therapists, uh, just one is a tiebreaker. <laughs> um, <you're right. laughs> That's yeah. a good point. So what's kind of interesting is, you know, we, we're stuck in this paradigm of I've got these negative thoughts coming in. I've got these negative behaviors coming out. And what we tend to do is if you think of what is driving those behaviors, what is driving those thoughts, because one is uh, it's useful to be mindful of them. But then at the end of the day, it's like, so freaking what? So you know you've got these thoughts. How does that help? I think where the real breakthrough comes in is when we realize this belief in our unconscious is driving all of these thoughts. And when we uncover that belief and we transform that belief, literally all those thoughts go away. So if you had a belief that uh, I'm a failure and you could have someone who's highly successful and that I'm a failure drives them to succeed, but it makes their life miserable – you can go in and transform that belief. And as soon as you transform that belief, what it does is all those negative thoughts disappear. And if you're doing that, of course, you want to make sure they're still productive. But I think fundamentally, when we get down to deeper levels, we create profound change. And we have to take the effort out of trying to live a balanced life. It just happens. That's good insight. Yeah, Gerhard, can I give an example for that? Sure, Dion. <laughs> Umar, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that, right? So my son is um, on the spectrum and we, we've done CBT with him. And it's really been interesting as a mom to go through that journey with him and then our neurotypical daughter. And then um, I would be a fool to not apply some of those things to myself, right? And so as this coronavirus hit, I was angry. And I am not an angry person. And to your point, I sat there and I was like, why do I feel, why am I feeling these things, right? And because it was, it was troublesome. And I feel like a kid stuck between two arguing parents. And so to your point, you have to kind of get through it. And then there's another therapy called EMDR and it's an Harmonization, have you guys all heard of that one? Yep. Yeah, love it. So there's a few books that I've, I've read on it and I was like, oh, so that's it, right? And so Gerhard, I agree with you. It's, it's the knowledge that we need with this and then it's a matter of recognizing and, and kind of um, 
reconciling and hopefully resolving some of these things. So once I figured out why I was so angry, I was like, oh, but I'm an adult now and I'm, I'm going to turn off the news because they're all crazy and we're just going to keep moving forward and control what we can control. Right. So, but I agree with you. It's, it's tricky to get to the bottom of it all. Now, I, th I think that, um, you know, we, we all work a little backwards where we become aware of our feelings. And I remember, um, you know, I was so calm and collected and I have three daughters and they were sort of freaking out about the coronavirus. And I, I thought, you know, it's not a big deal. You, you wash your hands, you wear a mask, you stay away from people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I thought I was cool, calm and collected and I got this resolved. And then every day uh, I woke up, I thought, is it still here? Yeah, it's still here. <laughs> so it doesn't go away. And, uh, and then I remember one day um, I was working late and uh, I was the only one in the office. And, uh, and all of a sudden it hit me and I thought, that stuff is not going away. And, and I had my, my panic moment. Well, what am I going to do? And, and then I called one of my daughters. Um, my wife was already asleep by that time. Uh, I was on the, driving back home and I said, uh, now it's my time for panic. <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, and so everybody has, uh, nobody is invulnerable. We are all vulnerable human beings. Uh, however, the, the good news is that we have a lot of different ways to look at that narrative that's at the core of everything. Something is happening, we tell ourselves a story, we relate that story to the past, we trace that story back, we change and edit the story and all of a sudden we feel better and that's the magic. But if we are not aware, then we are cooked, then we have the anxiety, then we have the, oppression, uh, the, the depression. And uh, one of the, the the formulas that I learned a long time ago is begin with accepting what is. So if I say I accept that situation, then you can understand it better and then you can change. So acceptance, understanding, change is for me the path to back to sanity. And uh, if, you, if you don't do anything about it, then uh, Things get to your body. And we talked about last week. Dr. John Sarno said that 90% of backaches are psychosomatic. Um, uh, you look at the other side, uh, Emil Coué from 1923. He was the French pharmacist who dispensed drugs. And um, he, he had a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion. And he, and he came up with the idea to tell people every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. That was his first auto suggestion. Mm -hmm. So he said to people, repeat this, uh, you know, 10 times in the morning, 10 times uh, at noon and 10 times before you go to bed. And uh, he had, you know, he, he claimed that he cured a lot more people with auto suggestion than with pills. And then his wedding room, uh, his pharmacy was inundated with people who came to learn personalized auto-suggestions. What does it do is it creates a new narrative, uh, uh, sort of a, a routine, a verbal routine that reduces the impact of that negative narrative. So it is a stopgap measure and it works. And, uh, and there are a lot of books about uh, the mind-body connection. So I want you to be aware of that, that your mind can be a healer and um, every one of your Unresolved issues impacts your muscles and hey, it, your heart. Your tissues. Yes, sir. So last week I had a client, just a business coaching client, and severe pain in his side. And as you know, but the other people probably don't, I'm a really good hypnotist. So hypnotized him, showed him a control panel in his mind with a gauge on it. Like, take a look at the gauge. What's the pain level? It's a seven out of ten. Go ahead and tweak it back, and literally within two minutes, the pain went down to zero. So that's the power we all have when we take direct control of our mindset. 
I want to make this clear. The positive mindset can extend your life, enhance your performance, and negative mindset will shorten your life and block your performance. And there's even a study by Dr. Becca Levy that said that people with a positive mindset live on average seven and a half years longer. People with a high purpose in life have a lower risk of heart attack, a lower chance of Alzheimer's, lower risk of stroke. Now, I want to shift uh, a little bit um, to something that I, I wrote a book a long time ago, Nonverbal Selling Power, about nonverbal communication in sales. And uh, I remember uh, reading that book by Julius Fast, who was the first one to write about body language in sales. And uh, we, what we do in our mindset training, we actually have everybody stand up and uh, put their arms over their head in a, in a Zuma victory position and hold that position for two minutes. And when you assume that position, you literally feel your confidence rising, your anxiety going down, and you are changing the state because of your physiology. And as you change your physiology, you change your psychology, you change how you feel. So that's another way to look at it. We, we talked about the cognitive part. We talked about the emotional part. Now we talk about that physical part. And when you look at the, the Wonder Woman pose, you know, uh, just put your, your hands on, on your hip, put your legs apart and see how, and put your shoulders back. And all of a sudden you have a new feeling. You change your physiology and you start breathing and uh, you literally feel a different person. So that's so important in sales because we are always hunched over. Uh, we're always on the laptop. We're always looking at a screen. And uh, what we need to do is build into our workflow a change in physiology. Here's a, a typical um, CEO position I remember when we did uh, an interview with Walter Hoving, he, he was the CEO of, of Tiffany's, and we did a photo shoot in his office and uh, asked him to, uh, you know, to assume a, a pose of authority. I didn't give him more direction. I didn't give him physical direction, but he translated that into exactly that same pose that, uh, that Trump is assuming. So there is something about when you, let's say, lose a sale and then assume that CEO position, then all of a sudden you take control back. You know, nobody can take control away from you on what you do with your body. And that's the victory position uh, that I uh, explained earlier. <clears throat> and you can look at any race at any Olympic event you see that position, gold medalists, uh, you know, they recover faster because they have achieved the dream. They have uh, gotten to the payoff. And, uh, and it, it gives them, a, uh, I've interviewed a, a guy who has won uh, two Olympic medals, um, uh, Jeff Rouse in, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And he said, uh, getting a gold medal is such a, a high that, uh, that lasts for years. And uh, he has leveraged this, uh, in, he, he has gotten in, in swimming and in Fredericksburg, there's a Chef Rouse center uh, where young kids learn to swim and he trains athletes. There's the dominant pose, you know, the, what Obama is doing here, legs uh, on the table, feet on the table, that when you assume that pose, you know, let's say you don't feel good because you, you had a difficult conversation with somebody like uh, Jonathan, the person you were dealing with last week, and, uh, and you want to feel better instantly, assume the dominant pose and you get out of that negative feeling. The last one is the superiority pose. So now um, I have, we have a little exercise and then uh, we're going to shift over to Natalie. Um, I want to give you an assignment and um, the, the customer said yes, um, but canceled after you sent the agreement for a signature, didn't get uh, budget approval. So I'd like to have three responses. Uh, what, is the, what is your narrative? 
how do you feel about it and what will be your physiological response? Um, so why don't you, we take, uh, take some notes. Um, let's work on this for a couple of minutes and then we um, share and continue. Well, I started examining it. So the narrative is, well, what happened? Uh, what did I miss? Um, was I talking to the wrong person? You know, a lot of sales analytic kind of questions, right? Um, the emotion was I was pissed and um, uh, upset with myself because maybe I missed something. And the physical thing was just uh, it's kind of an anger, like an energy, uh, an upset not, not upset, more like angry, like what, what happened and what can I do to make this work, go into action? What can I do to make it work? Um, um, so those were my like, boom, reactions like that, right? Um, and then I actually just br breathed for like a minute and um, settled into um, a kind of calmer place where all those things were happening but they were in a calmer place. So they were happening in a better, easier, I think, um, more productive way. Cool. So um, I'm, what I'm hearing is that, that you, uh, you get pissed off. Um, um, that is a, there's a, that's a trigger where you, you don't get sad about it, right? You, you, I never, I always have, I'm always confused when somebody doesn't buy something from me, Gerhard. I'm serious. It's like, I don't get, like, how could they not buy this for me? You know, if it's a legitimate thing, you know, if it's like, if it's something that they like, like what, you know, why aren't they buying this? So it's like, a, it's like when I, I, you know, I used to be a sales training nut, right? So I would go to a hotel and I'd be running a sales training program for a company A and there would be sales company B doing some training. And I'd say to myself, well, how come they're not doing the training? <laughs> it, it was nuts, but it was, you know, it was part of what, you know, part of that growth, that positive thing. Well, they, anyway, I don't get sad. No, I don't get sad. They have a different narrative. Um, okay. Megan, what, uh, what went through your head? Sure. So I did my, uh, like, kind of the bad habit responses and then I re I kind of changed the narrative based on this training so my initial narrative was I uh, kind of just like disheartened like why does this happen to me and like just that negative pattern um and I kind of just crossed through that and changed my narrative to one of curiosity or my mindset to curiosity and just became curious about the why um, this happened and then started to see uh, this as an opportunity to really explore what that, you know, customer mindset must be um, for this to have happened so late as well. Um, so really started to just yeah, get curious and kind of think about what I can do to explore this. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that, the, that that's a very um, intelligent way uh, of handling it, where you uh, shift from uh, that negative narrative to uh, curiosity, and then uh, which you know, allows you to learn from the experience. Uh, anybody else? My first response in the narrative in my head was, oh, the budget didn't get approved. I must have not conveyed the value of my product well enough. I must not have, you know, gotten the message through. I must not have delivered. And um, so emotionally, I start to say, you know, I start to feel a little, I don't want to say desperate, but a little bit like, oh, man, I got to get resourceful, time to get creative, time to, time to dig in, or this is make it or break it. And, um, you know, I kind of, it kind of turns onto a fight or flight per se, but to a, um, you know, do or die, make it or break it. This is kind of the last, you know, Hail Mary time to try to, 
you know, talk to a different person or talk to a different um, you know, decision maker. And so physically, I kind of start to feel my heart pound. It's slow. It's a, I, I meditate twice a day. Um, so I kind of feel somewhat in tune. And um, so I feel my heart start to pound. I start to feel things move slower and thinking more slowly and thinking more critically and um, trying to feel like these are, and it starts to feel like these are my last moves. Like the, the walls are closing in. Like if I don't, don't do something successful here, this is going to be, it's going to hurt. <laughs> That's kind of the reaction I, I feel coming on. So do you, is there any a way where you can think about this differently? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as I take a step back, which is, I think of what we've talked about a lot today and um, you try to evaluate the budget didn't get approved. Um, you know, I think, I don't know why the budget not being approved doesn't mean we can't keep moving forward with next steps. Um, that's probably my reaction is just to uh, stay calm and, and try to keep the conversation moving forwards with progress. So uh, think about the, the issue of control. Um, do you have control over that budget? No. Um, do you, can you influence uh, their thinking about the budget? I like to think so. And what, what would that be? What would that look like? Well, I think it would be a conversation around value rather than price. Um, you know, there's, if, um, you know, budget is looking at an expense and whether it can be accommodated and I want to talk about investment and growth. And, um, you know, I think that there, it's a different focus and a different, it's, a, it's shading the conversation in a different light of why you're still trying to get back in front of them to talk. You're trying to prove, um, not your product or yourself as much as um, an opportunity for their company. Uh, Megan, can you uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, explain how you would uh, ask some curio uh, curiosity questions? I'm trying to think here. I, I would want to take a very human approach and, uh, you know, hopefully you've built that trusted relationship with your the person who's making the decision or your champion and just um, have a phone call with that person and, and do troubleshooting. So, you know, ask what changed um, between our last conversation that we had and uh, the response that we're getting today. Um, is there, you know, what is your understanding of the, the status of the deal now? Um, what are your thoughts on the next steps we could take to just things like that to kind of open up the conversation and um, see where things stand? How would you, how would you address the, the budget issue? How would you find out what happened in that budget conversation? I mean, I think I would be maybe direct with it and just ask, you know, we, what did the budget get reallocated to a different project um like was was the project that we're working on reprioritized um and uh, start there um dion do you have an, uh, another approach another way to handle that but salespeople are not um always comfortable with uh talking about money yeah, I, I agree with you on that, Gerhard. And it's it's really interesting, right? Because as sales professionals, we have to get comfortable with money. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Everybody's got an issue with it, right? In some way, shape, fashion, or form, we have an, we have an emotional relationship with money. And so we want to get to that point with our sales team where we can do some of that training. But I, I think in this case, too, some of the questions that I, I'll ask typically or heard and really liked are, well, walk me through, was there somebody else that was bringing something to the table from a budget perspective where the need for the budget dollars was greater than the need that you have the budget dollars for this project, right? So when if, if sometimes when we're talking about money, it's nice to put things in a third person perspective versus, oh, you didn't get permission for this versus, oh, did, did was there another, is there another project internally that is a higher priority for budget dollars than this one. 
And sometimes that can unlock it. So putting it more in a third person, talking about it from a project perspective, um, keeping it keeping it objective is always good too. And then that gives us the follow on question of, oh, okay, well, how does your organization prioritize projects? And so if this project is going forward now, what does it look like to have budget dollars allocated to this project later? Or could we start a light version, right? Where does this particular project fit in a priority perspective? And then let's figure out what kind of dollars can we have associated to it? And we can start there. So it's almost consulting. That would be, well, asking those different questions in such a way that talks about, and it helps get to the answer of, is this even a priority for everybody? I, th I think you you nuanced it very well. Uh, the the only additional idea I would have is to preface mm -hmm. the conversation with uh, help me understand um, the challenges you found with the budget. So uh, and then ask about the process and ask about uh, have you considered a, a lighter version. Um, I think those those are all really good ideas. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, I would. The only thing I would add is I think in the scenario I'm thinking of, I'm assuming the person wanted what I was selling. Yes. Right? So to me, there must be some disappointment on their side. So my empathy would be with them first. Because mm -hmm. and, and then I think everything else we've been talking about would set it up beautifully. Right. So it would almost be like, you know, you must be really disappointed. We spent a lot of time. This seemed like a really good opportunity and you didn't get it, I'm sorry, you know, what happened? And then I would do it. So I think the first thing about empathy, um, not about not getting it, empathy about what they must be feeling like that they didn't get the money. So that would be the only thing I would add to the whole equation. I think, uh, I think it really completes it because you're thinking about the narrative on the other side. And yeah. that's very important. <laughs> it leads to decisions. Yeah. And if I could just say something, we're talking about Seth. I, I, I think a lot of things that sales people didn't do well and is they rush into doing something like they get that message and then they make the call versus take five minutes and plan out the conversation. Like give yourself a few minutes to think about how you're going to, you know, have the conversation and move it versus just reacting well. You know, I think it's really important. So, Jerome, you you have something on your mind that I'd like to know what it is. Well, you know, we, in, in some of the training that we do with our students, we talk about a, a process for handling an objection. And, and when I look at this situation here, this is kind of, you know, we, money always comes up in the sales discussion, just about every situation. And we, when I think about the, the budget thing that goes, I like what Dion was saying there about, um, uh, look at it from the standpoint of, you know, let, let's dig into it a little bit deeper and, and, and understand why that happened, you know, and, and understand that emotional connection that they have, like Jonathan mentioned. And if we, if we start putting those pieces together, then we can start building a collaborative solution uh, with, with our person. And I think if, if we can get it working from a, from a, from a standpoint of a, you know, a buyer seller mindset and working together now as a team, to understand what happened and come up with a, a better solution that, you know, that could get through the budget discussion and move forward with the close. Uh, that's what, that's what it would be all about. Because again, you know, most times in, in a selling situation, if the customer says no, whether it's them that said it or somebody else in your organization, no, doesn't mean never. It just means not right now. Right. You have to understand that that's part of that relationship building process and, and be ready to work with them to move forward you know, it might be a, a two month or maybe a quarter or two quarter delay and, and, and make it happen. But, it, but if, if, we can, if we continue working with it, we can, we can pull that out as we go forward. So I wanna, I wanna go back and sort of wrap it up. The, um, thank you, Jerome, for explaining your process. Um, the mindset process always involves three factors. You know, there's the, that narrative, you wanna be aware, what are you telling yourself? You want to be aware of your emotions. Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you d disappointed? Uh, you want to uh, become aware of your 
physical uh, action. You know, how do, how do you, you know, do you hide in the corner? I, I had an interview with uh, the CEO of DocuSign last year and he says, you know, sometimes I feel like there's so much, so much stuff going on that you want to hide under the desk, you know, because uh, it, it can be, business can be overwhelming. But what, what came out of this dialogue, and I think Jonathan uh, brought us into this uh, uh, different way of thinking, which is, it's not just about us. It's also about the customer. So showing empathy for the customer's situation is already a great step forward. But there's something else, which is when we are selling, we're pitching, we're in control. We know what we are talking about. We, we have the adrenaline. We are... We're in full uh, expression mode. But when we have to shift to listen and tease out the difficult elements that we don't want to necessarily hear, that is a real challenge. And you want to step into the role of the diplomat who has compassion for that other country and uh, listen to their difficulties and help me understand the challenges that you were facing with the budget uh, and and not uh, you know continue with sale mode but continue with exploring mode where you suspend your need for talking you listen and and you expose your chest to daggers you know that's that takes courage you know the you know the joe harry window yes so one of the things I love about the Joe Harry window, besides the fact that it was named after a guy named Joe and Harry, right, was the thing that really sticks out for me about that is trust, right? It was all about the window of trust. And the, the, the thing that builds trust is when somebody opens up and says something first, that they expose themselves or make themselves vulnerable first, right? Because then, the then the other side will do it. And I think what you just said, Gerhard, is exactly like Sometimes salespeople, we have to show some vulnerability. Sometimes we have to open up to, uh, and take a risk of opening up. Uh, I don't think it's that risky, but to take a risk of opening up so that the other person then feels safe, that that window is is being open. So, Thank you. Yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense. I need to wrap it up because um, Natalie is waiting very patiently. Well, I can chime in on how music and what you were saying about before you wrap it up. <laughs> right. There's been so much that I've wanted to respond to this whole hour and a half. Um, but music is a way, it's interesting to me to be on a call with a bunch of sales leaders because I wanna talk about how music can help you sell, how music's selling to you. And I was thinking a lot today about how I sell with music and it really is touching on a story and connecting with someone and not coming from a place of sales necessarily, but coming from a place of vulnerability. And um, I was writing down heart and curiosity and it's actually really easy on one hand and very, very personal on the other hand, when someone doesn't want to buy my CD or support my Kickstarter or something. And even some of the more, corporate gigs that I do and weddings that I play when they've decided to go with someone else. Um, and, and the narrative that I, that I have with myself when they do that, but it really does. Uh, it is that there's a lot of heart and then it makes it easier and harder to sell. And I just wanted to share that as we transition over, but yeah. We went through a sort of a discovery journey of uh, IQ, EQ and PQ. And we all have a choice on how we respond to situations. And, uh, and there's the cognitive response, the cognitive behavioral therapy response. Uh, we can address what goes on in our heads, our self-talk in, in many different ways. And uh, what we want to achieve over time is um, a higher level of effectiveness that begins with a higher level of awareness. So what I'd like you to do is for the next week between today and next Tuesday uh, to keep sort of a, a situational awareness journal where you 
describe the situation, describe your narrative, describe your feelings, and uh, describe how you re responded to it whether you reacted by getting angry and uh, how long did that anger last or that frustration and uh, how can you nip it in the bud and uh, address it almost instantly and talk back to the negative feelings. And uh, as you talk back to your narrative, you change your feelings and you feel better. So let's keep that journal. Um, and then we talk about it next week. <music>